Welcome back, friends. Welcome back to The Corbett Report. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan, here in April of 2023, with Questions for Corbett, specifically the 99th edition of Questions for Corbett. And this week, we are going to take our question from Paul, who writes in to ask, It seems that the JFK speech, part of which contains these words, The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy, etc., etc., has been deleted from the internet! Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. This is very disturbing to me. Do you have a copy of the full speech that you can share? Thank you so much for the work that you do. No, 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 Paul. Thank you for this question. It's an important one. Perhaps an even more important question than you realize, and you phrased it exactly correctly at the end to get to the real heart of the matter. What am I talking about? Yeah, the JFK speech. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. Yeah, I think now that you mention it, yeah, I do remember that speech. It's it's all coming back to me now. Yes. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. Record scratch! No! 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 You think you have heard that speech. And I know if you've been in the alt-media space for as long as I have, or longer, or even less time, no doubt you have seen the... One of the millions of things that used to populate YouTube, I'm sure it is probably unsearchable on YouTube these days, that goes under the name something like JFK Secret Society Speech. There were any number of them out there um, in the past couple of decades that I have seen. I've probably seen dozens of them that are that have the swirly cinematic background music and the and the, oh, ominous tones, and it has some helpful explanatory text to let you know that this was a speech that JFK gave the day before he was shot or something like that. And, and we all know what this is, what he was really saying. But yeah, Paul, thank you for asking the real question, the important question, where you ask, do you have a copy of the full speech that you can share? Oh, ding, 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 that is the real question. Because, yes, JFK said those words that you hear here in those types of clips that have been assembled out of this speech. But do you notice, it's not like he just got up and said, we are opposed by a ruthless conspiracy. <laughs> like, he didn't just start to, what on earth? What was the context of this speech? What was JFK actually saying? What was the speech actually about? What was the context? When and how was it delivered? The, this is a question with real answers, and those answers actually make it so that that speech that you think that you know, the JFK Secret Society speech, is absolutely, completely, 180 degrees, totally opposite to what you think, that, or what the way this speech has been portrayed. Let's put it that way. So in order to understand the speech, yeah, let's do a little bit of digging and find the actual speech, which is not difficult to find. It is not hidden. It's not in some secret corner of the internet. It's on jfklibrary.org, the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum official website, under the title, The President and the Press, Address Before the American Newspaper Publishers Association, April 27th, 1961. Couple things to note just from the title there. April 27, 1961. Well, let me do the math. Uh, that's at least, uh, what, two, two, almost two and a half years before he got his head blown off. Unlike, I know this has been portrayed online as uh, right before he was shot or something like that. Nope. <laughs> nope. This was at the very beginning of his presidency. So that's, that's an interesting thing to consider. Also, address before the American Newspaper Publishers Association. What's he talking to the newspaper publishers about and what's he trying to say to them? Again, this is not some grand mystery. You can go and read the speech for yourself. The entire transcript is there, but guess what? The entire audio, the unedited audio of the full speech is there as well. And as my service to you, Paul, and to everyone else out there who may be un laboring under the mistaken impression that JFK was calling out the Illuminati or something, uh, let's actually listen to the speech. The full speech 
Oh my God, it's like 20 minutes long, James. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Oh boy, we're going to have to listen to a complete speech, unedited. So to all of the uh, the fluoride-addled, TikTok-addicted people in the crowd who cannot stand anything that's longer than two minutes, bye-bye. Nice not knowing you. Please don't come back to the Corbett Report. But for everyone else who's in the Corbett Report audience who really do care about this information, I know you will want to listen to this speech. And when you do, you will see that everything that you have ever seen about this secret society speech is essentially a big con job that's been successfully perpetrated on a large section of the alt media for decades. At least uh, I've seen it. And it just goes to show, well, there's some very important lessons from this. But first of all, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pre-bias or judge anything. Let's listen to the speech in its context, and then we'll come back and dissect it. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate very much your generous invitation to be here tonight. You bear heavy responsibilities these days, and the article I read. Uh, some time ago, reminded me of how particularly heavily the burdens of present-day events bear upon your profession. You remember, may remember that in 1851, the New York Herald Tribune, under the sponsorship and publishing of Horace Greeley, employed as its London correspondent an obscure journalist by the name of Karl Marx, we are told that foreign correspondent Marx, stone broke, and with a family ill and undernourished, constantly appealed to Greeley and managing editor Charles Dana for an increase in his munificent salary of $5 per installment, a salary which he and Ingalls ungratefully labeled as the lousiest petty bourgeois cheating. <laughs> but when all his financial appeals were refused, Marx looked around for other means of livelihood and fame, eventually terminating his relationship with the Tribune and devoting his talents full-time to the cause that would bequeath to the world the seeds of Leninism, Stalinism, Revolution, and the Cold War. If only this capitalistic New York newspaper had... <laughs> had treated him more kindly. <laughs> if only Marx had remained a foreign correspondent, history might have been different. And I... I hope all publishers will bear this lesson in mind. <laughs> the next time they receive a poverty-stricken appeal from a small increase in the expense account, from an obscure newspaper man. <laughs> I have uh, selected as the title of my remarks tonight, The President and the Press. Some may suggest that this would be more naturally worded, The President versus the Press, but those are not my sentiments tonight. It is true, however, that when a well-known diplomat from another country demanded recently that our State Department repudiate certain newspaper attacks on his colleagues, it was unnecessary for us to reply that this administration was not responsible for the press, for the press had already made it clear that it was not responsible for this administration. <laughs> Nevertheless, my purpose here tonight is not to deliver the usual assault on the so-called one-party press. On the contrary, in recent months, I have rarely heard any complaints about political bias in the press, except from a few Republicans. <laughs> Nor is it my purpose tonight to discuss or defend the televising of presidential press conferences. I think it is highly beneficial to have some 20 million Americans regularly sit in on these conferences to observe, if I may say so, the incisive, the intelligent, and the courteous qualities displayed by your Washington correspondents. 
nor finally are these remarks intended to examine the proper degree of privacy which the press should allow to any president and his family. If in the last few months your White House reporters and photographers have been, in, have been attending church services with regularity, <laughs> that has surely done them no harm. <laughs> On the other hand, I realize that your staff and wire service photographers may be complaining that they do not enjoy the same green privileges, the local golf courses, which they once did. <laughs> it is true that my predecessor did not object, as I do, to pictures of one's golfing skill in action. But neither, on the other hand, did he ever be a Secret Service man. <laughs> my uh, topic tonight is a more sober one of concern to publishers as well as editors. I want to talk about our common responsibilities in the face of a common danger. The events of recent weeks may have helped to illuminate that challenge for some, but the dimensions of its threat have loomed large on the horizon for many years. Whatever our hopes may be for the future, for reducing this threat or living with it, there is no escaping either the gravity or the totality of its challenge to our survival and to our security. A challenge that confronts us in unaccustomed ways in every sphere of human activity. This deadly challenge imposes upon our society two requirements of direct concern, both to the press and to the president. Two requirements that may seem almost contradictory in tone but which must be reconciled and fulfilled if we are to meet this national peril. I refer first to the need for far greater public information and second to the need for far greater official secrecy. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society and we are as a people inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. But I do ask, <laughs> but I do ask every publisher, every editor, and every newsman in the nation to re-examine his own standards and to recognize the nature of our country's peril. In time of war, the government and the press have customarily joined in an effort based largely on self-discipline to prevent unauthorized disclosures to the enemy. In times of clear and present danger, the courts have held that even the privileged rights of the First Amendment must yield to the public's need for national security. Today, no war has been declared, and however fierce the struggle may be, it may never be declared in the traditional fashion. Our way of life is under attack. Those who make themselves our enemy are advancing around the globe. The survival of our friends is in danger, and yet no war has been declared. No borders have been crossed by marching troops. No missiles have been fired. 
if the press is awaiting a declaration of war before it imposes the self-discipline of combat conditions, then I can only say that no war ever posed a greater threat to our security. If you are awaiting a finding of clear and present danger, then I can only say that the danger has never been more clear and its presence has never been more imminent. It requires a change in outlook, a change in tactics, a change in missions by the government, by the people, by every businessman or labor leader, and by every newspaper. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. It conducts the Cold War in short. With a wartime discipline, no democracy would ever hope or wish to match. Nevertheless, every democracy recognizes the necessary restraints of national security. And the question remains whether those restraints need to be more strictly observed if we are to oppose this kind of attack as well as outright invasion. For the facts of the matter are that this nation's foes have openly boasted of acquiring through our newspapers information they would otherwise hire agents to acquire through theft bribery, or espionage, that details of this nation's covert preparations to counter the enemy's covert operations have been available to every newspaper reader, friend and foe alike, that the size, the strength, the location, and the nature of our forces and weapons, and our plans and strategy for their use, have all been pinpointed in the press and other news media to a degree sufficient to satisfy any foreign power, and that in at least one case, the publication of details concerning a secret mechanism whereby satellites were followed required its alteration at the expense of considerable time and money. The newspapers which printed these stories were loyal, patriotic, responsible, and well-meaning. Had we been engaged in open warfare, they undoubtedly would not have published such items. But in the absence of open warfare, they recognized only the tests of journalism and not the tests of national security. And my question tonight is whether additional tests should not now be adopted. That question is for you alone to answer. No public official should answer it for you. No governmental plan should impose its restraints against your will. But I would be failing in my duty to the nation in considering all of the responsibilities that we now bear and all of the means at hand to meet those responsibilities if I did not commend this problem to your attention and urge its thoughtful consideration. On many earlier occasions I have said, and your newspapers have constantly said, that these are times that appeal to every citizen's sense of sacrifice and self-discipline. They call out to every citizen to weigh his rights and comforts against his obligations to the common good. I cannot now believe that those citizens who serve in the newspaper business consider themselves exempt from that appeal. I have no intention of establishing a new office of war information to govern the flow of news. I am not suggesting any new forms of censorship or new types of security classifications. I have no easy answer to the dilemma that I have posed and would not seek to impose it if I had one. But I am asking the members of the newspaper profession and the industry in this country 
to re-examine their own responsibilities, to consider the degree and the nature of the present danger, and to heed the duty of self-restraint, which that danger imposes upon us all. Every newspaper now asks itself, with respect to every story, is it news? All I suggest is that you add the question, is it in the interest of national security? And I hope that every group in America, unions and businessmen and public officials at every level, will ask the same question of their endeavors and subject their actions to this same exacting test. And should the press of America consider and recommend the voluntary assumption of specific new steps or machinery, I can assure you that we will cooperate wholeheartedly with those recommendations. Perhaps there will be no recommendations. Perhaps there is no answer to the dilemma faced by a free and open society in a cold and secret war. In times of peace, any discussion of this subject and any action that results are both painful and without precedent. But this is a time of peace and peril which knows no precedent in history. It is the unprecedented nature of this challenge that also gives rise to your second obligation, an obligation which I share, and that is our obligation to inform and alert the American people, to make certain that they possess all the facts that they need and understand them as well, the perils, the prospects, the purposes of our program and the choices that we face. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people, for I have complete confidence and the response and dedication of our citizens whenever they are fully informed. I not only could not stifle controversy among your readers, I welcome it. This administration intends to be candid about its errors. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. We intend to accept full responsibility for our errors, and we expect you to point them out when we miss them. Without debate, Without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Solon decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, the only business in America specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to amuse and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. This means greater coverage and analysis of international news, for it is no longer far away and foreign, but close at hand and local. It means greater attention to improved understanding of the news, as well as improved transmission. And it means, finally, that government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information outside the narrowest limits of national security. And we intend to do it. It was early in the 17th century that Francis Bacon remarked on three recent inventions already transforming the world, the compass, gunpowder, and the printing press. Now the links between the nations, first forged by the compass, have made us all citizens of the world, the hopes and threats of one becoming the hopes and threats of us all. In that one world's effort to live together, the evolution of gunpowder to its ultimate limit has warned mankind of the terrible consequences of failure. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength 
and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. All right, I'm going to give you a second for everyone to collectively pick their jaw up off the floor and realize the extent to which the entire alt media has been had for decades over this speech. Because I know that my switched on, clued in Corbett reporters out there will already, will already have just seen and will know the importance of that speech and just how completely opposite that actual speech is to what it has been portrayed as. But I know that there are always new people tuning in. There may be normies out in the crowd. There may be people to whom you want to present this information who may not be as as switched on a critical thinker as you are. So let's go through it and dissect what happens here in this speech. And let me say, whoever was the speechwriter for this particular presidential address, because presidents don't actually write their own speeches. I don't know if you know that. But whoever was the speechwriter for this deserves a raise because this is a brilliant, a truly, really wonderfully uh, written exercise in how to lead an audience, a potentially very hostile audience, into a, a an idea that it should be extremely controversial. In fact, really is extremely controversial. But to do it in a way that people don't even quite understand what just happened. And I have no doubt that a lot of the people who left that room that night probably went home thinking a little bit stirred. You know, yeah, you know, he's right. Yes, this is a wonderful land of freedom of speech and Yes, we are the newspaper men who will deliver the truth. And and what was that other part that he said? Uh, well, anyway, it was a nice speech. <laughs> I have no doubt. But uh, brilliant, brilliantly executed. But let's look at how that actually works. So, of course, again, at the JFK Library, they have the entire transcript of the speech. And, of course, he starts out with that little anecdote about Karl Marx to, one, frame the context of this speech, obviously, again, in April of 1961 at the real, the the real height of the Cold War. We're approaching the Cuban Missile Crisis less than a year and a half from now. Uh, Gary Powers' U-2 was just shot down less than one year ago over Soviet territory. Uh, Yuri Gagarin had just, the Soviets had won the space race. They got the first person in space, right? So that was definitely in the news in April of 61. And what was that other thing that happened just to A week or so before this point. Oh, that's right. The Bay of Pigs. (laughs) The Bay of Pigs had literally just happened as JFK was uh, getting up to the podium uh, to make this speech. So there were a number of things going through his mind and the minds of the American people at large, and especially the people in the press at this time, thinking about the idea of, oh, I don't know, special secret operations like U-2 flights and Bay of Pigs and all of these things, these crazy wartime maneuvers that are being conducted here. But under secrecy, hey, press, you know, we have freedom of speech here, and that's why you guys are good at keeping secrets when you need to, right? Anyway, let's get into this. So, of course, again, he opens with that little lighthearted anecdote about Marx to kind of set the the tone, the theme, the lead people in with a sort of funny, haha, everyone has a good laugh. But he's also setting, of course, people in the mindset of, hey, we're in a Cold War against an ideological enemy, those, those damn Marxists, let me tell you. And then he gets into the speech. And this is the part that we all know. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. So all of this that I have highlighted in yellow is what you get hurt, what you hear in those highly edited, highly uh, trimmed down, carefully cherry-picked JFK secret society speech clips that you see on the GooTube and elsewhere. This is the part that you hear, but you never hear the but, and there is a big but in this speech, is there not? So yes, very word secrecy is repugnant. We have a free press, freedom of speech. You guys, we don't believe in censorship and concealment and da da da, the American way, apple pie and, but, (laughs) but I do ask every publisher, every editor and every newsman in the nation to re-examine his own standards, his standards of freedom of speech, no censorship, no concealment. Re-examine those 
those things. Because we have to recognize the nature of our country's peril. In times of war, the government and the press have customarily, see, this is part of custom, everyone does it, joined in an effort based largely on self-censorship, I mean self-discipline, to prevent unauthorized disclosures to the enemy. In time of clear and present danger, the courts have held that the privileged rights of the First Amendment must yield to the public's need for national security. Guys, it's in the name of national security. You have to shut up sometimes, right? Today, no war has been declared, and however fierce the struggle may be, it may never be declared in a traditional fashion, you know, going to Congress and getting a declaration of war. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> Our way of life is under attack. Those who make themselves our enemy are advancing around the globe, those damn commies. The survival of our friends is in danger. And yet no war has been declared. No borders have been crossed by marching troops. No missiles have been fired. The Cuban Missile Crisis is a full year and a half away. If the press is awaiting a declaration of war before it imposes the self-censorship, I mean self-discipline of combat conditions, <laughs> then I can only say that no war ever posed a greater threat to our security. This is it, man. This is the Cold War. If you are awaiting a finding of clear and present danger, then I can only say that the danger has never been more clear and in its presence has never been more imminent. It requires a change in outlook, a change in tactics, a change in missions, a change in those old fuddy-duddies with their freedom of speech, freedom of the press stuff. No, come on, guys. Self-censor... I mean, self-discipline. Come on. By the government, by the people, by every businessman or labor leader, and by every newspaper, right? Newspaper association that I'm addressing here, right? Right? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And then <laughs> edit back into those secret society uh, things that you find on YouTube. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet. Covet. I hate how he says covet. Covert means for expanding its sphere of influence on infiltration instead of invasion, blah, blah, blah. Oh, he's talking about the Illuminati, guys. He just got up and started talking about the the, the Jewish shapeshifters from planet Zeptar. He's talking about the, the cabal in charge of the world, guys. Oh, wait, no, he's talking about the commies. He's talking about the Cold War. That is precisely what this speech is about. And he's telling the newspapers to shut up. If you know what's good for you, don't report everything because we're in a war, guys. Self-censorship, I mean, self-discipline, self-discipline. That's the word. Uh, its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined, blah, 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 blah. And then you edit out, of course, the part where he says, it conducts the Cold War, in short, with a wartime discipline no democracy would ever hope or wish to match. Because he's talking about the Soviets. He's not talking about the Illuminati. <laughs> Nevertheless, every democracy recognizes the necessary restraints of national security. And the question remains whether those restraints need to be more strictly observed if we are to oppose this kind of attack as well as outright invasion. And anyway, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, the stirring end of the speech talking about the wonderful tradition of the free and open press in our free and democratic society, blah, blah, blah. It's the perfect sandwich technique. You start and end with the good flowery, feel good, every way. Hey, we're all Americans, come together. And you insert the little butt in the middle, right in the middle, where people are going to kind of forget, what was this speech about anyway? Uh, it sounds good. Yeah, freedom of the press, freedom of speech. Oh, yeah, but self-censor, I mean, self-discipline, self-discipline. We, we're in a war, guys. We got to come together for national security. So anyway, again, you saw this, you heard this with your own ears, you know it now. And so now we all know, and we're all on board, and we all understand, this speech is exactly opposite to the way that those cherry-picked quotes from this speech make it sound. Now, that is, that is, of course, for the historical truth of this particular speech by JFK, that is important to note. No, JFK was not assassinated because he gave a speech about the conspiracy or something. That is hogwash, self-evident nonsense when you actually hear the speech itself, as opposed to the highly edited clips that you're allowed to hear by the people who assemble these types of things, right? So that's, again, for the purposes of establishing truth about JFK and the JFK assassination and what happened there and why it happened, that is important for historical truth. And if you are interested in that, you might want to see my recent conversation that I had on the nature of false flags, where I talked I talked specifically about JFK and some of the reasons that 
he was actually assassinated, which are not because of this particular speech, which again is towards the beginning of his presidency. He's still processing the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis hasn't even happened yet. So there he still has a lot to go in order to transition to the Kennedy of 63. This is the Kennedy of 61. He is still very much trying to frame himself as the cold warrior, chest thumper. We're going to win this thing, guys, for freedom and democracy and self censor I mean, self-discipline. Self-discipline, that's the word. So, as I say, just for the purposes of knowing the truth about JFK and what the this, this speech was about and the context, that is historically important. But the broader issue here, which again, will not escape the attention of my more switched on, clued in, in intelligent, discerning listeners, is that can you see just how powerful media can be in shaping your perception of something to make you believe and perceive and know something that isn't real. It isn't true. Yes, in this case, it's not a deep fake audio, although that will come at some point, and no doubt we'll be able to hear JFK talking about the Illuminati or whatever directly out in the open. Hey, I never knew he gave that speech. Oh, it's been hidden for 50 years, guys. I just found it. And of course, it'll be a deep fake or whatever. But in this case, it's not even deep fake. It's just cherry picking. And that is incredibly, that is one of the key techniques that, of course, the establishment media has used for a very long time by failing to provide the context of a speech or whatever else they're reporting on. They can shape it into whatever narrative they want by taking out a piece here and a piece here and saying, hey, guys, look at what, look at what this person just said. Look at what just happened over here. But don't think about the context and don't don't know anything about this. And we're just going to present it to you over here as if it's fl floating on the clouds. So that is an incredibly powerful technique. And I know it's worked on a lot of people because, I, again, I'm not I'm not like calling out people in the alt media who have passed this along before or people who have have posted this up as if they are evil, consciously trying to perpetuate this deception on people, whoever originally cherry-picked this out of this uh, this particular speech and put it together in this way to make it sound like something it isn't, whoever did that in the first place, I have to believe was doing it consciously or was so stupid that they couldn't understand the speech and they thought, oh, he said the word conspiracy. I know what he's really saying. Um, but... Uh, there's there's some deception that goes on at some level, but then but then you see how it just becomes the telephone game, and nobody who is interested in the two minute JFK secret society speech is going to watch James Corbett's big long rambling forty minute questions for Corbett episode on it. <laughs> Context, schmontext, just get to the point, right? And the point is uh, ruthless conspiracy. Uh, we're opposed uh, to secret societies. Okay, there you go. JFK was a truther, man. I tell you. So, unfortunately, it's the old adage, yes, you know, the, the uh, lies spread around the world while the truth is still tying its shoes or whatever, however that phrase goes. Anyway, you get the point. But I think this also brings up an incredibly important focus on to the point that the media matrix that I was talking about last year, you do remember the media matrix, right? And I hope you have seen that. I hope you have digested that and uh, internalized and understood the importance of of what I was presenting there. And if so, please get my online media course, six hours of lectures that go even deeper into that material. Uh, but once you do so, I hope you understand, I'm not just talking about the establishment controlled media that of course lies and uses deception, cherry picks, lies by omission as well as commission and takes things out of context and puts things together to make things seem a way that they are not. But it's not just the establishment media that does that. That happens in the alternative media too. And again, whether people are doing it consciously or not, they are doing it. And I know, I know a lot of people still believe, oh yeah, JFK gave a speech about warning about secret societies or something, who have no idea about the context of this speech and what it was really about. Now, I, having said all of that, I will give the big caveat that I am incredibly thankful to see that as I was looking it up this time, and I don't know how Paul was attempting to search this, um, presumably on YouTube or something, and I have no idea. I don't search YouTube, but I'm going to guess if you type JFK Secret Society into YouTube, you're probably not going to get anything of relevance. But I went to Odyssey and typed in JFK Secret Society, and the speech is all over Odyssey, and presumably BitChute and other places like that, Rumble, I don't know. But 
it's not hard to find, and it's not hard to find those cherry-picked, cut-up, completely misrepresentative examples. But, uh, at least on Odyssey, as I did that search, I found multiple people who were posting up the entire speech and were saying, hey, this has been portrayed as da-da-da, but actually... So, it is starting, there are people who are starting to catch on to the idea that, oh, you know, maybe when I hear some contextless, weird speech that sounds like it's been cut up and put pasted together, maybe I should look for the source. Maybe there's a reason that the Corbett Report's entire ethos for the entire duration of its existence has been open source intelligence news, as in, hey, here's the source of what I'm quoting. Here's So you can go and you can see the context and you can see what it means. And that's not just empty rhetoric. That's not just a, it's not just some sort of pizzazz or something. No, that's a real thing that really matters because it really does matter whether somebody is taking something out of context and making something that isn't real appear real. That, my friends, is lying. That is what the media does all the time and not just the establishment media. Lies absolutely do get propagated through the independent media. And I see it all the time these days when people are posting headlines or screenshots of headlines of some article and people are having entire conversations about the screenshot of the headline of some article that they haven't read that nine times out of ten is not what the headline seems to be portraying. And you have these entire discussions around something that isn't real. It happens so much more often than I think most people understand. And at least today, for those of you brave info warriors who made it through a big long discussion about this secret society speech, you will understand this on a visceral level. And you will be able to share this with other people who are propagating misinformation. And which, uh, you know, disinformation, misinformation, blah, blah, blah. Th that really exists. There really are people who are spreading factually untrue things because they do not understand what it is, what the real truth is. They haven't even bothered to look for the source. Anyway, I could go on and on and on about this, but I think that's probably good enough for today. Anyway, as usual, I will link up, of course, the sources of all the things that we've seen today and listened to, and in order for you to go and start exploring it and see the context for yourself, because that is incredibly important. And we'll continue going forward in that exploration here at The Corbett Report. I hope you will be there to join me. But that's it for today. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Looking forward to talking to you again real soon. Real soon. Real soon. Real soon. Real soon.